Hi everyone, it's Blake here from ChessPathways.com. Welcome back to another video in my Getting Started series, and today we are going to be talking about tactics. So looking forward to what we're going to cover in this video, first we're going to talk about what are tactics, what makes them so important. Next we're going to talk about the relative value of the chess pieces. Thirdly, we're going to talk about the various tactical essentials, the essential elements of tactics that are going to be important to you when you're playing chess. And then we're going to practice. So let's go ahead and get started. First, what are tactics? Tactics are the hand-to-hand -hand combat of chess. So when we're talking about tactics, we're not talking about grand plans, we're not talking about long-term planning, we're talking about checks, captures, threats, sacrifices. I go there, he goes there. If I make this move, what does my opponent do? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about tactics. As I stated, tactics are not long-term planning. They're very much the move-to-move -move calculations in chess. And finally, tactics are so important because tactics are what are going to decide the vast majority of chess games between beginners. And they don't really go away as you get higher up in the chess ranks, but especially between beginners. If you watched my video on the end game, you know how you can convert a material advantage, meaning when you have more pieces than your opponent, you've learned how easily that can be converted into wins using the basic checkmates. And very often in games between beginners, someone is going to mess up tactically, they're going to miscalculate something, they're going to allow their opponent to uh, capture one of their pieces for free, and that can very easily be converted into a win. Long-term planning is great, and deep strategy is great, and you're definitely going to be exposed to that more as you get better, but it does you no good if you come up with this great plan, you outplay your opponent for most of the game, but then you blunder your queen. You move your queen somewhere it can be taken. <laughs> your opponent gets your queen for free. It doesn't really matter if you outplayed your opponent for 99% of the game. If you do that, you're probably going to lose. That's why tactics are so important. Now, before we go any further, let's just briefly talk about the relative value of the chess pieces. Uh, because tactics have so much to do with trading material and gaining and losing material, let's say you trade a knight for a bishop, or you, you lose a pawn but you gain a knight, or you lose your queen but you get a rook and a bishop, Who's coming out ahead in these exchanges? That's such an important question to know the answer to when we're talking about tactics. So this is just a brief guide of the, of the relative value of these pieces to each other. In general, if you're a beginner, you can assume that a pawn is worth one. The pawn's the least valuable. Then the knight and the bishop are both worth three. We call these the minor pieces. Then the rook is worth five. The queen is obviously the most powerful piece. She's worth nine. And the king is, of course, priceless. If, <laughs> if in any exchange you, you end up losing your king because you get checkmated, uh, there's no amount of other pieces that could make up for that, because if, you're, if you get checkmated, the game's over. Those guidelines are handy to keep in mind, uh, so you know that you shouldn't just, of course, like trade your queen away for a knight. That's not an equal exchange. But they're not coded into the rules of chess anywhere. They're not official. Um, there are situations where a knight could be stronger than a rook, for example. Another kind of nuance here that I see beginners mess up a lot is that they'll happily give away two minor pieces for a rook and pawn early in the game. For example, it's white's turn here, and I'll see a lot of players do this exchange, and they'll capture a pawn, they win a pawn, they lose a knight, they win a rook, they lose a bishop. So they lost two minor pieces, right? They lost a bishop and knight, that's worth six. They gained a rook and pawn, that's five plus one, so that's also worth six. So you would think this is an equal exchange, but this is really bad for white to do early in the game. They traded away their only two pieces that are active, their only two piece, uh, pieces that were developed. The rest of their pieces are sitting here on the back rank. And early in the game, the rooks aren't as big of a factor. What are these two rooks doing, right? They're still hemmed in by their pawns. Black just has a lot more activity here to compensate him for that material. So you can't always go by those numbers, but they are some good rough guidelines of what's an equal exchange and what's not. With that said, now that we know the value of the pieces, let's get back to basics and start discussing the most basic tactical ideas here that apply in the game of chess. And the simplest one is just called a hanging piece. That's when you put a piece on a square where it can be taken for free. So we have the opening position here. Let's say white opens with pawn to d4, black plays e6, and white were to play this move bishop to g5. A terrible move. Tactical themes can be as simple as this. Black just sees, well, <laughs> I can take a piece. This bishop is attacked once, and there's nothing defending that bishop. So let's go ahead and grab it. And black will play queen takes g5. Now, if black fails to play queen takes g5 for some reason, let's say they do make some move that does nothing, now white has a hanging piece tactic of their own. They see that the queen is attacked. The queen is defended, but because the bishop's worth less than the queen, the bishop's worth three and the queen's worth nine, this is still a hanging piece tactic. A piece can be taken that's worth more than the piece you're going to lose. So white can simply scoop up the queen, and now white has a huge advantage. They traded away a bishop for a queen, and we know because we just learned the value of the pieces, that's a hugely favorable exchange for white. So that's a hanging piece tactic, when you can simply take something for free, 
or when you can capture a piece worth less than the piece you're going to lose to capture it. Those are both examples of hanging pieces. Sounds simple enough, but if you just learn to avoid hanging your pieces, just avoid putting your pieces on squares where they can be captured for free, and you learn to punish it when your opponent does it, you'll very quickly progress through the beginner ranks. Next up, a little more complex, we have a tactical idea called counting. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, let's say that white plays this move e4, black plays e5, white plays knight to c3, and now it's black and black plays this move d5. We know this move's not safe because of the counting technique. White has one, two attackers on this square, and black only has one piece backing it up, this queen. So because white has more attackers than defenders, this move is not safe. White can actually capture either way. Let's go ahead and say they capture with the pawn. And this was simply a free pawn. Black cannot recapture because that would be a hanging piece tactic, of course. Um, but if black doesn't recapture, they've given away a pawn for nothing because they messed up the counting technique. And the counting technique simply states that if your opponent has more attackers on a square than you have defenders, your opponent is going to come out on top for the battle for that square. Now let's go ahead and go back to the beginning position again. Let's say white plays e4, and now black plays d5 right away. This move is safe, according to the counting technique. White has an attacker on this square, but black has a defender. White does not have more attackers than defenders here, so by the counting technique it is safe. White can't win anything here. White can take the pawn, but they'll lose a pawn right back, and it's an equal exchange. The move is safe. Black doesn't lose anything. The reason the counting technique is a little more complex than just the hanging piece is that the counting itself doesn't absolve you of the need to calculate out the, the sequence that's going to occur and evaluate what's going to be won and lost. For example, let's go ahead and take a position, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, uh, knight f6, knight g5. Okay, white has two attackers on the f7 pawn, right? The bishop and the knight. Black only has one defender. So let's say black thinks, okay, I'm in trouble here. White has more attackers than I have defenders on this pawn, so by the counting technique I'm in trouble. But if I add a defender, I'm going to be okay. Now white has two attackers. Black has two defenders, so white doesn't outnumber me, so I'm fine. So let's go ahead and see what happens, though. If white was to capture on f7, and black takes back, and white takes, and black takes, the counting method was correct that black comes out ahead in the battle for this square. Black maintains control of this square at the end, and the white pieces are wiped out. But white only lost a knight and bishop worth six points, right? Three plus three, whereas black lost a pawn and queen. Nine plus one, that's ten. So even though black had an equal number of defenders that white had attackers, this didn't work out well for black because his defender was so important compared to the value of the minor white pieces that were doing the attacking. So counting will show you who will come out ahead for the battle for that square, but you still have to calculate what's being exchanged. Another common example of when the simple counting technique doesn't work that well is when we're dealing with a pawn defended by a pawn. It's Black's turn here, and let's say he notices, hey, I have two attackers on this d4 pawn. White only has one defender. So it should be safe for me to capture, right? Well, no, because a pawn defended by a pawn is usually safe from captures from any pieces that aren't pawns. If Black doesn't have a pawn involved in the attack here, he can win the battle for the square, but the exchanges aren't going to work out well for him. All right, let's say that Black takes with the knight. White takes back. Black takes. Once again, because black did outnumber uh, white on that square, black does come out ahead for the battle for that square. But he gave up a knight, and white only lost two pawns. That means white lost two points of material, black lost three. That was not a good exchange for black. So the key takeaway here, counting is very important. Uh, it, it shows you who's going to come out ahead for the battle for that square after a series of exchanges. But you still have to take the time to look at what's actually being exchanged and making sure that you're coming out ahead and not losing any material. So counting and the hanging piece are two of the most simple tactical themes, and if you can master those, you're going to be way ahead of most beginners. Now we're going to be looking at some tactical themes that have to do with making two attacks at once. So let's say it's Black's turn here, and Black plays this move bishop to d6. Oh sorry, it wants me to make a move for white. It's Black's turn here, and let's say Black plays the move bishop to d6. This would be a bad move because of something called a fork, and a fork is when you get to attack two pieces at once. White here can play this move e5, attacking the knight and the bishop, and black actually can't save them both. No matter what black does here, white is going to end up winning a piece for just a pawn, and white is going to come out ahead. For example, let's say that black retreats the bishop, then he will lose the knight. Now, he'll get the pawn back, of course, but that's three for one. That's not good. Or black could save the knight, but then he will lose the bishop. And either way, white comes out ahead because they attack two pieces at once. Let's take a look at another example of a fork, <clears throat> this time done by a knight. So it's white's turn here, and white should play the move, knight to c7 check, forking the king, 
and the rook. Now notice how we also have to look at the counting technique here because this knight is attacked, but it is defended. So it would not be good for black to take that knight because they would lose a queen. So we see how tactics start working together. They start building on each other. Here we have the, the, the counting uh, technique used to back up this fork because we know it's, it's not safe for black to take this knight. So if they're not gonna take that knight, they have to move their king according to the rules of chess. They can't let their king be taken, but then we get a rook for free. So we attack two things at once, black can't save them both, white wins material. Next, we're gonna be talking about pins and skewers, which are very much related. And they usually have to do with two pieces being lined up. Usually one of them is the queen or king, but not always. It's, it's, white's, it's white's turn here in this position. And let's say white was thinking about taking this pawn. Now by the hanging piece method, this looks completely safe. It looks like there's nothing defending that pawn and you can take it, but you would be mistaken because you are falling for a pin. If white goes ahead and takes this pawn, Black would be able to play this move rook to a2, pinning the queen to the king. Again, another way that two pieces can be attacked at once, this time in a line. And we see by the counting technique, the rook is safe here because if the queen takes the rook, the bishop would take back and white comes out behind in that trade. So there's nothing white can do here to avoid losing a queen for a rook. Now, the queen cannot move away because the king would be taken and that's illegal. So there's nothing white can do here. White can either take the rook themselves, but they're going to come out behind in that exchange or they can defend their queen, but they're still gonna come out behind because the rook is worth less. Black still gets to exchange the rook for the queen and black comes out ahead. Let's go back. So if white doesn't capture that pawn, uh, white has to find a different move. Uh, white still has to be careful of some tactics though. Let's say white plays the move queen to g5. Black has another tactical idea here. Uh, this tactic is called a skewer, bishop to c4. This still has to do with two pieces being lined up uh, the difference is this time the more valuable piece is in front, and instead of pinning it to the piece in the back, you're basically shoving it out of the way to get to what's behind it. Here the king has to move out of the way, and instead of the other situation where the queen couldn't move out of the way, here the king has to move out of the way, and black will get to exchange the bishop for the rook. And by the way, probably promote the pawn on the next turn. That's not good for white either. But even if this pawn weren't here, the skewer is still good for black because black gets to exchange a bishop for a rook, and a rook is more valuable. I'll get back to some examples of how pins can happen early in the game too, but let's take a look at a more advanced tactical motif here. So back to this position. It is currently uh, white's turn here and we talk about how white could not take this pawn. Let's make a slight change to the position though. Let's say that, uh, I'll just waste a move for white. Let's say that the black king is on f8 instead of g8. So you probably think this shouldn't make a big difference, right? But here, is it safe for white to take this pawn? Think about it for a bit. Pause the video if you want to try to figure it out yourself. So here, it actually is safe for white to take this pawn. Black's pin does not work. Rook a2 does not work because of another tactical idea we have called removing the defender. Here, we said this move is only safe because of this bishop. So here, white can do a temporary sacrifice here. White can give up the rook for the bishop because it comes with check. So black temporarily won a little bit of material there. They won a rook for a bishop, but we've removed the defender of this rook. Now we can take the rook for free and white comes out ahead. So you see how all these tactics are starting to build on each other and work together. And you have to use all of these ideas to calculate when you're playing chess. So why did this not work before? If we go back when the king is on, on g8, if we play here, black plays here, we don't have time to remove the defender. We're not giving check when we're, when we're removing this defender. So black can ignore this rook for now and just take our queen and then take our rook next turn and that didn't work out at all. But when we get to do it with check, we gain time. Black doesn't have time to take our queen yet because they're in check, and that one little bit of difference makes all the difference in the world. So let's take a look at this position from the opening. Black might like here to play the move rook to e8 to kind of bolster their center here, to uh, give more support to their e5 pawn, put this rook on a more open file, but it turns out this is a mistake. Go ahead and pause your video if you want to see what white's going to do here. So white can play this move d5, and once again, uh, black has ran themselves into a pin. If this knight moves away, white's gonna be able to exchange a bishop for a rook, which is good for white because the rook's more valuable. But if the knight doesn't move away, white's gonna be able to exchange a pawn for a knight, and that's also good for white. So again, because these two pieces are lined up, black's in trouble. Now, black can try this move a6, attacking the bishop. So now that if, if white takes the knight, black can take that bishop, and it's gonna be an even exchange. Uh, go ahead and think about what you'd wanna do if you were white here, though. White still has a way to win material, and it turns out white can simply play the bishop back to a4, maintaining this pin. And now there's really no way out for black. Black's going to go uh, have to go ahead and lose material here. So this is probably the most common kind of pin in chess, especially early in the game. 
a bishop along these two diagonals here, either to the king on e8, or the queen on d8, or here black's already castled, but this time there happens to be a rook on e8, um, and just all these pins that can occur with the bishops early in the game are probably the most common kind of pin in chess. Now that doesn't mean every time you get pinned it's something to worry about. Let's actually go ahead and go back to the starting position so you can see what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and play some opening moves. C4, E6. And let's say white here played the move bishop to G5. The knight is pinned to the queen, right? The knight can't move because the queen would be taken. But this isn't really a concern yet because there's nothing white can do to win material here. Black can just break the pin or something. Black can play bishop E7 to break the pin, or black can try to kick this bishop away. Now the bishop would have to address this because this is a hanging piece now, right? The pawn's attacking the bishop. And if the bishop exchanges off, black doesn't lose anything. If the bishop retreats, black doesn't lose anything. So the pin, in and of itself, doesn't win anything. These tactics themselves, it's not that the tactic exists that matters. The tactics are tools to use in your calculation, as I've shown in the instances where they all start working together. And you have to use these ideas to calculate the I go there, he goes there, kind of back and forth to see who's going to come out ahead when pieces are exchanged. Okay, so so far we've covered... Hanging pieces, counting, forks, pins, skewers, removing the defender. Here's another one. This one's called the Desperado. So here it's White's turn, and White has a disadvantage here. We see both sides have two rooks and a queen. Both sides have two minor pieces. But White has six pawns and Black has seven, so Black is a little bit ahead here in material. Black's up a pawn. But it's White's turn, and let's say White decides to go ahead and attack the Black Queen. White plays this move pawn to g3. Uh, now there's a hanging piece tactic available. This queen is uh, threatened to be taken, so black has to address this. And let's say black decides to address this a little creatively. Let's say black says, I don't have to move my queen. What if I just go ahead and attack your queen right back? Then if you take my queen, I'll take your queen. And that's an equal exchange, right? Now, sometimes it is okay to counterattack, but when you start getting these positions where multiple pieces are hanging, because now the white queen is hanging, the black queen is hanging, you have to be very careful because some really unexpected tactics can pop up. Here, pause the video if you want and think about how white can win here, or at least get a, a very big advantage. So if it was white's turn here, white can win here by playing queen takes f8, taking this rook. Now this looks crazy at first glance, right? Because this rook is completely protected. The, the rook's protected twice, and you only have one attacker on it, and it's your queen, and you're giving away a queen for a rook. But it doesn't matter, because you're going to get a queen back for a pawn. And because you're taking with check... We've seen this idea when we talked about removing the defender earlier. Because you're taking with check, black doesn't have time to do something similar with their queen and get their queen to safety. They have to recapture your queen somehow, and then you get their queen. And it turns out white won a rook. Now white went from having a disadvantage to having a, a massive advantage, an advantage big enough they should just always win here. So the concept of the desperado is there's multiple pieces hanging here, so I'm going to sell myself as dearly as possible, give up this queen for the rook, so that I can get a queen back for the pawn. So the moral there, if you ever are gonna enter those positions where there's multiple pieces hanging, things start getting very complex, you better be sure that you're asking yourself, what's my opponent gonna do here? And look for tactical ideas your opponent might have to make sure something like this doesn't happen to you. All right, next up, here's a tactic called the overworked piece. So here it's Black's turn. And Black should be a little concerned here because their d5 pawn is under attack by a whole lot of white pieces. It's attacked by the knight, the bishop, and the queen three times. It's only defended twice by the knight and queen. So black would love to castle here and get their king to safety, but if they castle, it's safe for white just to take this pawn based on the counting technique. White can take that pawn, and there's nothing black can do to win any material back. They're just down a pawn. They can exchange knights if they want. Uh, they definitely shouldn't keep taking, <laughs> but in the end, they just come out a pawn behind. So in light of that, black played the only move they thought that would defend that pawn. Oh, sorry, let's go back before they castle. Uh, and black played the move pawn to d4. This actually occurred in one of my games. I was white here. Uh, this was a tournament game I played back in, I think, 2012. But I had the white pieces here. I was attacking this pawn. My opponent didn't want to lose it, so they pushed it to d4. Sorry, uh, d4. So here, I have one attacker on the pawn, and it's defended once. So now, by the counting technique, it's safe, right? If I take the pawn, black will take my rook, and that's not good for me. But black has an overworked piece here. Let's look at their queen. The queen is having to be the defender of this pawn, but the queen's also having to be the defender of this rook, because now my queen is eyeing this rook. So I found the tactical idea here, the overworked piece, and just took this pawn, which doesn't look safe, right? Because it looks like black can take my rook, but I calculated that if they take my rook, I take their rook, with check, by the way, as a, as a nice added bonus. So I still win the pawn. 
And that, that ended up being what happened in the game. Black took my rook, I took, I took their rook, but that's just an equal exchange. And I still come out a pawn ahead. I won that d4 pawn. So another thing to always keep an eye out for. If a piece is having to do too many things at once and be the defender of too many pieces, always kind of keep that in the back of your head and see if you can work out in your calculations if you can exploit that. So we've looked at a lot of tactical themes that have to do with pieces being won and lost. Now let's look at some themes that involve checkmate. This first one here is called the weak back rank, and it has to do with a rook or a queen just sliding down to the, to the back rank and checkmating your king because it's trapped in by its own pawns. So here, it's white's turn, white's down a pawn, white would love to just take their pawn back, and by the hanging piece method we see that this pawn is quote-unquote free, but white can't take this pawn, because if they take the pawn, they fall prey to the back rank checkmate, the rook just slides down, their back rank is what we call weak, the king has no escape, and they have been back rank mated. Now one important thing to remember is just because some of these tactics have to do with checkmates instead of with just winning and losing pieces, that doesn't mean you can't use these themes to win and lose pieces. Everything works together, like I've talked about. So here, let's say it's Black's turn, and Black decides to capture this free pawn, the hanging piece. Uh, this is not a safe move because of, Boy because of Black's weak back rank. Now it doesn't look like they have a weak back rank, but they do. It looks like they have an escape square here, but it's not because this bishop covers it. Uh, here, White can go ahead and just take this knight. This looks like an unsafe move based on the counting technique because white wins a knight, but they're going to lose a rook. But the rook cannot be taken. Black can't take this rook because of the weak back rank. So black can avoid that, of course. This doesn't result in checkmate. It only results in, in white winning a knight. But of course, that's still really valuable. Black's going to have to do something besides taking that rook back. They're going to have to move their rook away or something. And now white's way ahead. White just won a knight for free because they exploited the weak back rank that black had. In a way, this is also another example of the overworked piece. Here, this rook was, was the defender of the knight, but it was also the defender of black's weak back rank. This time it wasn't two pieces that the piece was overworked between. It was a piece and the weak back rank, and white exploited it here. The rook can't do both jobs, and white comes out ahead. Okay, the next one is almost, almost exclusively an opening tactical idea, and it's called the king's weak diagonal. Uh, it turns out that this diagonal to the king, the short side diagonal to the king, is very weak. It's actually the cause of the fastest checkmate in chess. If you haven't seen this before, let's say white plays f4, black plays e6, and white plays g4. This is the fastest checkmate in chess. Black can play queen h4 checkmate, and it turns out white can't block this check at all. <laughs> it's simply checkmate. The knight can't help, the bishop can't help, uh, the two pawns that could help have been pushed. So it's checkmate. Uh, so this doesn't happen very often, of course. People don't just allow themselves to get mated, but there's a lot of themes that pop up on this diagonal to the king that can cause you concern, especially if you push your f-pawn early. If you're newer to chess, I would recommend don't push your f-pawn early. Make sure you get castled, because you don't want anything to do, to, to, to do with the, the, the tactics on this diagonal. So let's go back and look at some other ways this happens to be exploited. So let's say white plays e4, e5, good moves, knight to f3, attacking this pawn. And black usually plays like knight c6 here or d6 to defend that pawn, but let's say black tries to defend it with the f-pawn. Here, white can surprisingly exploit this already. White can just ignore the fact that the pawn's defended and take it, believe it or not. It doesn't look like a safe move, because this knight is kind of a hanging piece here. You gained a pawn, but it looks like you're losing a knight. But this diagonal is so weak, you can actually exploit this. So the pawn takes, but after queen to h5 check, uh, it turns out black has no good way to deal with this. If they play g6... Then what do we notice? We have a fork, right? The king's attacked, the rook's attacked, they're gonna have to save their king and we're gonna win a rook. So now who came out ahead, right? We gave, we invested a knight into this attack, we lost a knight for a pawn, but we just got a rook for it. And they're gonna get a pawn back, but that's not too, uh, too consequential. White's coming out ahead here. Or they could play king e7, but I mean, look at this. If you have to play the move king e7 in the opening, uh, this is more than worth it for white. Uh, to be to be down a knight for two pawns. It's only down one point of material, right? The knight's worth three, the two pawns are worth two, uh, but this king is in just massive trouble here, and it turns out there's all kinds of things that are going to happen here. Uh, the, the king's probably just going to end up mated. Now, can you just blindly sacrifice a knight anytime you can give a check along this diagonal? No. In fact, a lot of time the check won't accomplish anything, so you have to be sure. For example, if there was a knight already on c6, this wouldn't work. Uh, because of this and g6 and you couldn't take here and there wouldn't be a fork and you didn't really accomplish anything. You just forced this pawn to come forward and now you're down a knight and you don't really have an attack. So you can't blindly do this. You, you have to calculate out just like I've been preaching throughout this whole video. Keep the themes in mind but in the end you have to do the calculations. If I go there what's my opponent going to do? How do I respond to that? But keep these themes in mind. They are very helpful.
Now, not only can this diagonal be weak, the f2 and f7 squares themselves can be weak. So let's go ahead and get back to that starting position. Starting position. Uh, there's another very fast checkmate in chess that has to do with this weak f7 square. So let's go ahead and look at some moves here. White simply attacks f7 twice, and if, if black ignores this, uh, if they ignore the counting technique here and don't notice that white's attacking something twice and they only have one defender on it, and they play some move, they simply get checkmated. So you always have to be careful of this pawn. Let's go back to the starting position again. Let's take a look at one more example, this time from a famous game from the uh, 19th century, which started like this. Knight f3, d6, bishop to g4. Oh, sorry, d4, bishop to g4. White took, black took, takes, takes, bishop to c4. And here, black thought that they could defend this threat, right? Because white has two attackers on this pawn, they're threatening checkmate. Black played knight to f6 to defend by cutting off this queen. So now it's not safe to take, right? Because black would, would win a piece. They would lose a pawn and win a piece. But white was able to exploit the same theme by playing queen to b3 with a fork. They're attacking the weak f7 pawn and the, the b7 pawn, which isn't defended and black cannot defend both of those things. And white here has a big advantage. Finally, just two more fun tactical ideas I wanna show. And by the way, this is by no means a comprehensive list. These are just a long list of themes to kind of get you thinking, but in the end, it all comes down to that calculation. And you'll, you'll build up your pattern recognition the longer you play chess. But now let's go ahead and talk about something called a discovered attack or a discovered check. So from this starting position, let's just get to an opening position where I know this occurs. I don't worry too much about these moves right now. Oops, c6, here, here. And white plays the move bishop to d3, which at first glance does not look safe because uh, counting, by the way, is so important whenever there's pawn tension in the openings. Almost every turn you have to be verifying that nothing is able to be taken for free. Here, black has one, two, three attackers on this pawn, but white has three defenders, so it's safe. But it looks like bishop d3 is not a safe move because now your queen is cut off from the pawn, you only have two defenders, and black has three attackers on this pawn. So go ahead and pause your video if you want, think about is it safe for black to take this pawn and win a pawn? Or what's gonna happen if they try to? Okay, if you're back with me, so it's definitely safe to take once, right? This is an equal exchange, pawn for pawn. But now can black win a pawn here? They have two attackers on this pawn, there's only one defender, so let's see. They win a pawn, they lose a knight, but they gain a knight. So it looks like they came out a pawn ahead, right? Well, not so fast, because white has something called a discovered attack, and a discovered attack is when a piece gets out of the way of the piece behind it, and it's another type of double attack, but this time instead of a fork, where you're attacking two things for the same piece, it's two different pieces doing the attacking. Here white wins by playing bishop to b5 check. They give this check, which isn't a dangerous check, but can easily block the check, but their queen is also now attacking the queen because this bishop got out of the way. So no matter how black, how black addresses this check, they're going to end up losing the queen. So you'll want to be aware of this theme as well. Remember, that double attack, it doesn't always occur just from one piece attacking two things at once. You can have two different pieces attack two different things with this discovered attack technique where one piece comes out from behind and the piece that got out of the way is also attacking something. Finally, one more, and this one's pretty rare. I mostly just want to show it because it kind of increases our uh, appreciation for the game of chess. I remember I saw this idea for the first time probably about nine years ago now, and I just thought it was amazing. It's called a pinwheel, and you'll see why it's called that. So don't worry about these, uh, these moves right here. I'm just trying to get to the position. See if I can remember it. Yeah, I believe black played queen h4 check. Queen f6, knight b5, threatening this uh, this fork. Black played this to avoid it. White played here, and black played this move a6. So check this out here. White plays the move bishop to b6, check. Black has to play king to e8. Knight c7, check, getting the fork. But it's more than just a fork, this is a pinwheel. What this means is white is basically setting up a series of discovered checks they can keep giving at will as this knight goes around and around. You'll see what I mean. So black has to play king to d8, it's the only, oops, king to d8, it's the only legal move, right? They can't come here because the, uh, the pawn covers that square. So king d8, the knight takes with check, right? Discovered check, the knight got out of the way and the bishop uh, was revealed to attack the king. Now the knight comes back with check to reload and the king has to come here and now the, the knight can move wherever it wants with check again. 
So <laughs> you, you probably see that you can play knight d5 and attack the king and queen at once. That's winning. But why not take this pawn first, right? Just for fun. <laughs> black, black can't do anything, so we give check. Their king has to come back. We come right back and reload. The king comes back. We give check again. The king comes back, and finally we break the cycle and take the queen. And so this pinwheel allowed this knight to grab everything it could reach. <laughs> Plus one thing, it can reach in two moves because of the, the discovered check. So very powerful there. That doesn't happen very often, where the, where the king is forced to come back and forth, and you can keep reloading this check and go around and around. Uh, that's why they call it a pinwheel. All right, so now you have a whole bunch of tactical themes at your disposal. If you're feeling overwhelmed, uh, that's okay. This is a lot of information to take in all at once. Don't worry about memorizing all of this. I hope that just the general sense of what I'm doing here gives you the, the idea that to, to, to keep in your mind while you're playing chess to just be aware of these things, to keep in mind, to ask yourself that question, you know, if I make this move, what's my opponent going to do in response to it? And if you can just keep in mind the two most basic ones, don't hang your pieces, right? And don't, don't miscount, right? Just make sure that you have more uh, defenders than your opponent has attackers to make sure all your pieces are safe. You're going to be far ahead of most beginners, especially if you can punish them and they fail to do these things. When they put a piece on a square where you can take it, or where they make a pawn move where you have two attackers on it and they only have one defender, um, and you punish them for those things, you're going to be way ahead of most beginners. So you have a great foundation. And we're going to talk in a future video more about how to practice your tactical vision and how to train yourself on this, because this is so important. But just for a little taste of it, let's do one practice position here. So you're white here. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the bigger screen. Yeah, you're white here. Uh, go ahead and pause the video here and think about what you would play in this position. Think about all the threats your opponent has, all the threats you have, um, and what would you play? All right, so let's see what you might have noticed. You might have noticed that black has this pin on your knight, right? They're pinning your knight to your queen, so that's annoying. Uh, but they're not threatening to win anything with that pin yet. Um, maybe you suggested to break the pin, so that's definitely good that you were thinking of the pin. Or maybe you suggested trying to kick this, this bishop away. Um, that's good. Uh, white has a better move, though. Did you also notice maybe that your pawn here is hanging? Black has an attacker on that pawn, and you have uh, no defenders on that pawn. So if you suggested that white should defend that pawn... That's great. That shows that you noticed a piece you had that was undefended. You added a defender to that piece to make sure your opponent couldn't win anything. Uh, now it turns out here that uh, black still could win something, though, because they have two attackers on your knight here, and you only have one defender. Black could take, take, and come out upon a head. Now we notice that we have this same queen lined up on the queen, so you might be looking for discovered attacks, but we don't really have any good ones. The bishop can't just jump out here and give check, like in that last example, because the queen would just take it. So if you kept looking, you were looking for ways to deal with this pawn situation without losing anything, maybe you decided on something like just exchanging these knights off, that's an equal exchange, and now you can defend your pawn. And yeah, white's, white's safe here, white's not going to lose anything. So that's good. If you came up with that, that's good. You found a solution to the problem, you saw that you had something that was an attack, you didn't want to lose it for free, so you made sure you didn't lose it for free. Great. But white actually has a way to get a big, big advantage in this position. So if you notice these, these ideas black has, that's good. But did you notice this idea white has? White can play bishop to b5 and pin the queen to the king. Now, you might have dismissed this move if you, if you didn't think it was safe. You might have said, yeah, I can give this pin, but this bishop's undefended. I know that by the hanging piece method, uh, the queen would simply take that bishop. But if black takes the bishop, we have a fork. Fork in the king and queen. So it turns out... This bishop to b5 move, sorry, bishop to b5, this wins the queen for a minor piece. There's nothing black can do about it. Either they uh, succumb to the, to the pin and lose their queen to the bishop, or they can take and lose their queen to the fork if they want. But either way, they're going to lose their queen. So we see how the pin and the fork work together here. You'd have to see both of those things to find this tactic. So you can see how even in a seemingly simple position like this, uh, before, before bishop e2, even a seemingly uh, simple position like this, this, there's so many tactical ideas going on with these pins, the hanging piece, uh, uh, another pin, uh, the fork, all kinds of things going on here. So I could see how this could seem overwhelming, but if you stay alert to these ideas and just always calculate out, hey, I, you know, I see this pin. Let's see if it leads anywhere. It doesn't look safe, but if black takes, do I have a move? Oh, I notice a fork. And your pattern recognition will get built up the more you practice this. And like I said, we'll talk in future videos about how to practice this more efficiently. Uh, the purpose of this video is to expose you to all these ideas and help you start thinking tactically. And if you can just do this better than your opponent and end up being up material, taking more of their pieces than they take, than they take of yours, then you'll be able to use the techniques we learned in the in-game video to convert that material advantage into a win. And those two things are really your biggest toolkit for beating beginners.
beat them tactically, play safe moves and take their free stuff when they give it to you, and then convert it into a win with those basic checkmates. Alright, thanks for watching this video. Remember to check out the site chesspathways.com. Not only are we building this out into a comprehensive getting started video series, we also have game analysis videos there for our members. Uh, so please check out the website and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks.